Hey everyone, Biofan here with the lead writer for Dragon Age, the bringer of feels himself, Bioware's Patrick Weeks. Hello everybody. So let's start out with, you know, one of the hardest questions ever. What is your favorite color? Oh my god, you said we weren't going to have to cover this. <laughs> you promised that we were going to stay away from hot button issues like this. Um, <laughs> I am all about jewel tones and my favorite color is blue. Awesome. Awesome. How long have you been at Bioware? Um, l- between 10 and 11 years. It'll be 11 years for me in March. So I wow. joined Bioware right before they shipped Jade Empire. Nice. Awesome. Uh, what does the position of a lead writer on a video game entail? So a lead writer on a video game has three major areas of responsibility. Uh, the first yeah. thing they have to do is represent the writing team to the other departments, and that is kind of midway between being an ambassador and being a champion. Um, the goal is that departments are working well together, everyone is on the same team, you're all trying to make the game, but if there's something that the writers need that they're not getting, the lead writer is the one who has to go uh, you know, fight to get that stuff represented for them. That's mm-hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing that the lead writer does is um, write a lot of the game. And that seems like a duh, but, you know, it's just uh, a lot of the crit path. uh, Sorry, the crit path is the main parts of the game, the parts you can't miss. Mm -hmm. Uh, So a lot of the major important uh, beats, the prologue, the epilogue, um, anything that you're like, yep, this is is something that everyone's eyes are going to be on. The very juicy story bits in the game. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. That that that's what the lead writer hits. And then the third okay. and final thing is that the lead writer is a mentor uh for the team. The lead writer is uh when dealing with the other writers, uh he or she is the is the quality bar. The one saying we are always going to be at this level. No, this is how we do plots. No, this isn't how we do plots. Um and in also helping the writers become better writers themselves. Every writer who I've uh who I've worked for with them as a lead, um, has helped me become a better writer in a different way. What are you currently working on? So, I cannot say what I am currently working on. Uh, Mm -hmm. What I can say is that it is awesome to see people uh, were so in love with Dragon Age Inquisition and are so interested in the franchise and are looking forward to seeing where we go next. Um, Mm -hmm. We don't have anything that we're prepared to announce right now, uh, but... Right now, all I can tell you is that we are continuing to work, and I hope that people are patient, and I hope that people are interested in Mass Effect Andromeda. Awesome. What were some of your sources of inspiration when writing characters like Solus, Iron Bull, and Cole? Oh, those are good questions. Um, That's, yep, so those are the three followers I wrote, and... Okay, so when I write a character, I have what they start as and what they finish as. And the two are always different um, because I start from a very rough picture. Um, And frankly, the picture I start from is almost, well, it is, I'm basically stealing something else. I'm stealing some other character and I'm using that character with my own, with a couple of tweaks Mm -hmm. to turn it into something new. That's always how I start. And by the end, it's always the character stands on their own. Yeah. Uh, so Solus, for example, uh, was well with Solus. It was tough because we cannot, we could not just have him be. We could not own who he was in the main game. We couldn't have him go. Yep, I'm the Dread Wolf. That would have that would have probably caused. <laughs> that would have ruined a lot of the tension. That would have that would have made things pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, it would have been an interesting lead. Um, yeah, but we also couldn't have the secret of Solus be the main thing about him, uh, because that was my first draft, in fact, and it was terrible, because what you had in the fir- in my terrible first draft of Solus was a character who spent the whole time saying, you know, I know something about this, but I can't really tell you. And uh, it turns <laughs> out that having that for 100 hours is not particularly fun to play. That's just mean. <laughs> um, so I honestly ended up um, with Solus. I started from a little bit of Doctor Who, Okay. Um, specifically, David Tennant's version, just because I always partic- I always love the mixture of humanity and just the little hints. Sometimes when mm-hmm. uh, David Tennant's doctor, when that when the when the mask would slip away and you would see the ancient person looking out from those eyes, and I love that. I love the mixture of compassion, humanity, with something far older in there. Uh, so 
that was kind of uh, some of the place where he started. It didn't hurt that, you know, Gareth David Lloyd is, uh, is an alum from Torchwood and brought, <laughs> and as soon as his incredible voice came in, that, that pretty much gr- pulled me to what Solus was going to be and what we shipped as. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, with Iron Bull, uh, the cartoon um, Archer. Okay. With uh, H. John Benjamin as the spy. Mm-hmm. It was like midway between Archer and um, was it Patrick Peter Warburton as Brock Sampson and the Venture Brothers. Uh, basically, those two kind of mashed together as like, this is the biggest, burliest, manliest <laughs> dude you are ever going to talk to. And he says inappropriate things and he is rude and he beats the hell out of people. Um, and also, in both of those cases, both of those characters are great because in addition to all of that, like, if you're... Those are manly, manly men, but they also have this one, like, they're, you know, once per episode, there's this, oh, he knew something I didn't expect him to know. Oh, he had, he had a softer side that in no way takes away from the fact that he just clubs someone to death with a chair, mm-hmm. but, you know, he still cares about haikus or he still cares about <laughs> flowers, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of where I started from with, with Iron Bull. And then when Freddie Prince Jr. came in, again, that just locked the voice for me. Freddie... Mm-hmm brought a, a characterization, um, a level of culture that I don't think would have been there if we hadn't gotten him as the voice. His voice is incredible. Um, I mean, frankly, we've been really, I, I was really lucky with all of my voice actors, Gareth David Lloyd, um, Freddie Prinze Jr., and James Norton as Cole. Um, all three of them really, they just disappeared into their characters, and all three of them, you know, did as much or more than I did in terms of making those characters who they were. Every time I interview a voice actor and I ask them, like, who did you think was really good? Who did you really like hearing in the booth? They always, always specifically mention Freddy. Every time. Every time. Well, he just throws himself into it. I mean, I remember um, on Mass Effect 3 when he was doing Vega... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was punching his own hand and stuff while, uh, while doing, you know, the boxing or while, you know, while doing the, the heavy bag work and you're like, all right, the dude is into it, man. He is, yeah. he is making this happen. It was awesome. And then what were some of your sources of inspiration for Cole? Um, Cole is a little bit harder. Um, so I honestly, Cole was in many ways, um, high school Patrick. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's high school Patrick merged with Cole from Dragon Age Asunder, uh, the novel that Dave Gator wrote where Cole first appeared. So I took that and I said, okay, this is a character. He's young. He's figuring himself out. He is so sensitive. He is so unversed in how people work. And he really needs something. You know, he, he's, he's looking for... He's looking for people who can teach him what it means to be people. Mm -hmm. Um, And while I don't identify as being part of the, uh, the autism spectrum or the neuroatypical spectrum, there are, uh, you know, there, there's elements of that that run in my family and just being able, like, I, I know what the experience of being, um, overstimulated, emotionally overwhelmed, having to having to withdraw and get off into a place where I can just sort of tap the wall to reconnect with reality again. You know, that's a part of me. Um, but and that was something that I kind of you know I took to Cole and said, okay, this is this is Cole. Cole is in a world. He is a raw nerve. He has no filters that can help that can protect him from you know all the senses he's being bombarded with and is totally unprepared for, and this is how he reacts and deals with it, and that and that's why you know he's that's why he's parts you know sponge just soaking up everyone's pain and hurt and then you know voicing it at inappropriate times, and part of why he has to withdraw sometimes. So how did the possibility of Iron Bull's death in Trespasser come about? Okay, this one was tough. Uh, because the bad news on having a character die in the game as a possibility means that you are inherently limiting how much they could ever appear in the future. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, that's not a hard limitation. We, we had Ash or Caden die in Mass Effect 1 and still have them as full squad mates in Mass Effect 3. So it's not like that's a hard line, but whatever you say, hey, this, char- this character can die if this happens in the game, um, it makes it a lot harder to bring them back in the future. And so it was definitely something we thought long and hard about. Um, that said, when we got to the Canari, we kicked, a- we kicked around different ways to do it. We said, oh, okay, 
maybe it's a rogue faction of the Canari, and they aren't really the real Canari, and Bull doesn't believe in them. And every time we tried to talk, we tried to talk ourselves into that for a while. Like, oh, Bull wouldn't do this. They're not the real Canari. They're an offshoot. And it just got so toothless. It it got to a point where you're like, no, really, who wants to play a game where you're fighting the offshoot of the offshoot of the offshoot? <laughs> we own this. The Canari mm-hmm. aren't being used anywhere but in our games. So if we're going to say the Canari are going to start a war, let's have the Canari start a war and let's own it. And in that case, they're, the only reasonable outcome was that if you hadn't gotten Iron Bull out of the Kuhn, it made no sense for him to do anything but turn on you. And it's one of those things where, you know, I don't know if we had, if we would have done things differently if we had known, oh, we definitely want to have the Canari in the Trespasser DLC, uh, and what does that do for Iron Bull? You know, if, if we'd known that, you know, years and years ahead of time, if we would have changed Iron Bull's plot some way, or if we had changed, had him start as a Talvashoth or something like that. But I really like that choice. I love that we gave you a choice and that it didn't immediately have a white hat and a black hat on it and that it was a choice that had teeth. I love those because it was really interesting after Trespasser shipped watching the reaction to those because there were, you know, many people who were surprised and very unhappy and said, this shouldn't have happened, even though I turned Bull, even even though I made Bull loyal to the Kuhn, he still should have respected me and not turned on me. And there were a few people who would say that, but every time someone said that, everyone else would turn and look at them and go, what did you think was going to happen? You... You did a plot and told this guy specifically to be loyal to the Kuhn. So yeah, mm-hmm. when the Canari come... He, he, you did a plot that told him to stay on their side. And so really, there really was no other way for us to do that. And, it, you know, it certainly wasn't something I was happy about. It wasn't something Freddie was happy about. You know, it's a wrenching thing doing something that you know is going to lead to, it, fortunately, at least the possible death of his character rather than the definite death of his character. But, you know, it's a wrench doing that stuff. Um, but I... I I did that to the uh, the actress who played Tally in Mass Three. I did it to the actor who did Morden in Mass Three. You know, doing it to Freddie Prinze Jr. Here, you know, it's never happy, but you know, in all those cases, the actors looked at it and go like, "Oh, this is what's happening. This is the plot. Yeah, this is what my character would do." And if it makes sense that way, you just have to go with it. Exactly. Um, for me personally, um, I don't know if you remember when uh, I tweeted at you, I'd like gone to the grocery store and bought all these things like cookie dough and chocolate and wine <laughs> to like prepare for Solus. Excellent. And then my Solus Mancing Inquisitor um, was very militant. So when it came to deciding Chargers or Kunari, she was like, well, I get an army if I do this. You so, get some dreadnoughts duh. on this end, yeah. Yeah. So then when I got to Trespasser and the Iron Bull thing happened, I was just like, wait, what? 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 Womp, what? Womp. No, no. And I, I've never screamed so much at my TV before. And I thank <laughs> you for that. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask, as someone who did that, did you yes. uh, did you hit Solus's question, or did you? Because because then later in uh, when you have your conversation with Solus, mm-hmm. he will say, um, also BT Dubs, uh, your Inquisition is full of spies and totally not trustworthy, uh, and you have the option to call him on that and go like, no, no, my Inquisition is totally not full of spies. Did you hit that question? Because if you do, then he says, oh, I guess you're right. You know who we should ask about that? Iron Bull. How's he doing? And he just digs it in. So. After I recovered from the fact that there was nothing that could be done, like, I reloaded and didn't bring Iron Bull with me, he comes through the door anyway, I had finally, like, a good, like, couple hours of emotionally preparing myself to continue, I eventually got to Solus, and I was like, okay, here it comes, and then he says that line about Iron Bull, and I was like, I can't. You jerk! It's too soon! <laughs> How dare you! <laughs> There may have been some some like fist shaking and mentioning of your name. <laughs> you know, if there if there's anyone who will who who about whom you can say you are right and also kind of a jerk, it is Solus. <laughs> mm-hmm, exactly. But like I personally like I love when you encounter those like super emotional scenes. Even if characters I love die, I'm just like this is what makes a story great. <laughs> like when you encounter those kinds of things. So props to you. Um, how was Cole's appearance and character in Inquisition influenced by Asunder? 
Oh, um, well, Dave and I talked about him a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Dave had where you know where he put Cole at the end of a sunder, and, and the original version of Cole that we, we were thinking of going with would have been much closer to that. Um, the problem with that is that that was a good story, but that story was also inherently finished when Dave finished a sunder. Um, mm-hmm. So we looked at it and said, "Okay, this is cool. This is great." I don't want to just have, I, I, you know, I didn't want to just retell that story because Dave had told it really well and I would just be doing a poor man's version of Asunder if I redid it. So at that point, we kicked around ideas and said, okay, where does Cole go next? What is he going to try and do next? And so that was kind of the process we tried to go with. It's a difficult process whenever you are dealing with a character that someone else wrote first. Um, mm-hmm. I did that a little bit with uh, with Tally in Mass Effect 2. Uh, Drew Carpatian, I believe, had written her in Mass Effect 1, and you know he kind of talked with me about what she cared about, what mattered to her, and then I carried that forward in Mass 2 and 3. Um, and in the you know in the same way, Dave said, okay, you know here's what here's what motivates Cole, or here's what motivated him in the novels. Here are the questions he was asking, and now that he's found the answers, you know it's up to you to figure out how he goes forward. Mm-hmm. So I'm not super sure if you're aware of this or not, but you know, you know, on the on the Thetis map, maybe kind of like <laughs> Southern Treventure area, there's this dot, and you know, next to this dot is is word, you know, Solus. You know, um, I, th- I think we may have sunk a dagger into <laughs> yeah, into think, into a spot not far from that map in the yeah, in the final cutscene. It was it's pr- pretty close. Is it is it is it a city or a town? Do people live there, or is it like some kind of ironic Thetis GPS tracking system? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it is. Uh, it is at least a large town or a city if it shows up on the mm-hmm. map, because the, there are countless cities throughout Tevinter. Tevinter is a huge empire, and there are countless cities that aren't important enough to show up on that map. So. If they if it shows up, you know it has to be an interesting one. Um, the other thing at, about Tevinter is I don't know if you did any adventuring with both Solus and Dorian in the party. I probably did at some point. I um, confession: I have thirteen inquisitors. <laughs> okay, fair. So you, so yeah. the so the odds are good that there was a mage a mage party playthrough. There was there's pretty good odds. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Solus and Dorian together have an interesting banter arc. Um, where Dorian keeps bringing up interesting Tevinter magic that he wants to show Solus to go, hey, you like magic in the Fade? Here's this interesting thing from Tevinter. It's Tevinter magic. It's cool. And every single time Dorian does it, Solus gives him this look. Well, he doesn't give him a look because it's banter, but, you know. Verbal imag- look, basically. Imagine he gives him a look uh, and goes, yeah, actually, that's Elven, and your people <laughs> stole it, so... Uh, and uh, so much of Tevinter is uh, is is the Tevinter people arriving, seeing the remains of the Elven Empire, uh, and basically spray painting uh, human faces over the Elven faces and knocking the ears off the statues. So, a given that Solus is the Elven word for pride, it is totally reasonable to say that yep, there are there are some cities that are going to have Elven words in them. And whether that in any way relates to our favorite uh, apostate hobo elf <laughs> is up for future games to uh, to deliver. Okay, okay, cool. So what, if any, is the correlation between the names of Morden Solus <laughs> and Solus? <laughs> I think this one was just uh, was just goofy luck on my part. Okay. Because it, the name was picked well before I got there. Okay. Okay. It was just I, they had the word for pride and said, "Yep, it's his, this is his name." It's I can't, if it's somewhere between. It may literally mean to stand tall and mm-hmm. uh, and the notion of pride, but that was what they had, and it just happened to be the same as uh, Professor Morden Solis's last name. Okay. And then okay. and then he ended up in my lap. Okay, so just happenstance. All right, that's cool. <laughs> Can you give any further insight into that post credit scene in Inquisition with Solis and Flemeth? What can you tell us about what occurred in that scene? I don't know that I can. I mean, I think okay. all, all I would say is play, play it with fresh eyes after, you know, play it with fresh eyes after uh, maybe if you have it open in one window and your talk with Solus in Trespasser open in the other window and just go back and forth and see what resonates. Okay, okay. Uh, what are your personal thoughts and opinions of Mayveris Talani? Oh, May. I like May. 
I think May's okay. cool. Uh, awesome. I think she is great because, like Dorian, um, she is a Tevinter person who shows you that not all Tevinter characters are one note. And mm-hmm. I think that Dave did a fantastic job introducing a trans character and not having the plot be about her being trans. Uh, <laughs> she's a cool character. She's a powerful maid. She is um, ruthless, but not evil in uh, keeping herself protected and gaining power in the Magisterium. And I hope that we have the chance to do stuff with her at some future point, whether awesome. it's in games or novels or, or whatever. So, um, in general, do you think that it's possible that we might one day see a romanceable transgender character in a Bioware game? Absolutely. Um, I see no reason we wouldn't do that. The kicker for us would be twofold. Um, Mm -hmm. first we would of course want to, uh, we would be, we would workshop that ruthlessly to make sure that we did that, uh, in a context of, um, respect, sensitivity, making sure it was presented in a positive light. Um, there are, uh, when I, when I did some writing on creme, um, I showed early passes of creme to, uh, some trans, genderqueer, intersex uh, fans, you know, who are under NDA, and got really good feedback, uh, figured out many, many places where I, as a cis uh, white dude, was completely screwing up and uh, gratefully had the chance to address those. And, you know, even even after doing that, have still heard things from fans that like, okay, so next time we write a trans character, uh, I'm going to do this differently. Next time, you know, next time hearing that, I'm going to do that differently. So it would definitely be something we would have to handle sensitively. And mm-hmm. it would be, um, you know, much like, much like the experience of just having crime as a character was, it does take more time. It does take more work. Um, it is absolutely worth doing. Uh, the only other qualifier I would put on it is... When we think about doing things like this, um, they cannot just go into the game for no reason. So if we have a character, if we have a transgender romance in some future game, the hook cannot be, this is the transgender romance. Mm -hmm, Exactly. It it has to be like, uh, Tally was not, this is the Quarian romance. Uh, Tally in Mass 2 and then in Mass 3, uh, or at least in Mass 2, the hook was, this is the shy, awkward, crush romance. Uh, Garrus was, this is the friendship romance. <laughs> um, the, you know, they have to have a hook, and, the tra- and, and we could not have the hook be, this is the transgender romance, because if you do that, you, there's, there's not enough other interesting emotions that makes them human beyond that. <laughs> so we would be looking for that. Uh, no, okay. No. Yeah, so like I said, absolutely no reason we couldn't do it, just those are things we would bear in mind as if and when we ever tried to do that. Okay, awesome. Oh, so I put out an announcement about the interview and then asked fans for questions that they were curious about. Uh, what, some of them were like, what were the reasons behind Cole not being romanceable in Inquisition? And then him having the possibility of a relationship with another character in Trespasser. Oh, okay. Yeah, totally fair. Um, so in Inquisition, Cole was still figuring out how the human stuff worked. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, beyond the simple budgetary factor of we already had a lot of romances and did not really have the budget to add more, um, it really didn't seem appropriate to us at the time to have Cole as a romance possibility. He's just too um, too young in spirit, if not in physical age. Mm-hmm. Uh, too young to an experience. It really felt like having the Inquisitor romance Cole would be the Inquisitor taking advantage of the nature of their relationship. Yeah. Now, in Trespasser, a couple of years had passed, and in the scenario in which Cole is more human, it seemed reasonable to us to say, okay, he's been human for a few more years now, he's trying to figure this stuff out. Actually, we hinted at the possibility um, if you've made Cole more human in his conversation in the epilogue of the main game, mm-hmm. when you go and talk to people at the party, he says something about like, oh, this person uh, maybe wanted to hang out, and I think they wanted to kiss me, and I'm not sure about that, but I'll think about it. And he doesn't commit to anything then. Mm-hmm. But then two mm-hmm. years later, we say, okay, it's it's reasonable now for Cole to be exploring this stuff in a very, you know, in a very gentle, in a very innocent way. Um, the reason we didn't let the Inquisitor do it is because... 
Trespasser is, you know, we were really proud of Trespasser, and we thought Trespasser was a fantastic conclusion to the story, but trying to introduce a new romance that wasn't a romance in the main game into Trespasser felt like that would have been really, uh, not, well, well, tacked on seems like a bad way to say it, but I guess it's okay to say it because it's a thing we decided not to do. Mm-hmm. So uh, we just, that was why we decided not to do it. It just, it felt like if we said, oh, and now you can romance him, it it just really didn't feel appropriate to, to try and throw that much work uh, and then say, hey, player, you can get the first kiss or whatever, and now the game is over, and you're, uh, <laughs> it's like, well, okay, that's just a recipe for more sad. Yeah. Uh, so what's the deal with Solus's jawbone necklace? Does it hold <laughs> some kind of significance, or is it just there to be kind of like a clue to his identity? I think the artist, that was Nick Thornborough, did the original mm-hmm. on that, and... Um, and you know, artists and writers are big on hiding in plain sight. And they, they, you know, that was that was the wolf jawbone necklace that we said, "Yep, he's absolutely wearing that." That uh, it looks cool. You look at it on your first playthrough and go, "Yep, that's something an apostate hobo elf might have." And maybe it's kind of got a a shamanistic purpose, or you know, maybe it's it's something he just wears for you know because it's a the first piece of jewelry he had growing up. And then you know, you look at it in the second playthrough and you go, "Oh, come on." Like, how did I miss that? It was right there. (laughs) Uh, What kinds of fan feedback are the most constructive when looking to improve future titles? Oh, that's a good question. Um, So we look at a lot of things. Um, So what we first look at is, you know, what people say to us directly, um, what people say to us at conventions, what people say to us on social media, um, you know, there's a, a fantastic uh, subreddit, actually, that uh, one of our producers found that says, you know, futures we're looking for in future Dragon Age games. And, you know, we definitely looked at that and went, okay, this is interesting. Um, I think for us, I can't answer for all developers, but I can say that the, the, the feedback that gets me is... I'm happy to hear I liked this. I'm happy to hear I didn't like this. Um, What matters to me is why. Um, I didn't like this. Well, okay, I'm not going to write exactly the same character next time, so it doesn't really help me. Okay, well, I didn't like like, uh, Mother Giselle. Well, okay, I'm probably not writing Mother Giselle again, so I don't really know what to do with that. I didn't like Mother Giselle because she seemed too one note and didn't have uh, multiple facets or all seemed to play into these negative stereotypes. Okay, now we're talking. I can hear that and I can hear that and 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 look at that and go, great. You can work with it and improve in the future. Yeah, next time I'm writing a different character, I can ask myself the same, you know, a, a character that could fall into that same trap. I can absolutely ask myself the same questions and go, okay, I, I heard this last time. Let's make sure I sidestep that particular landmine. Um, the other bit of feedback that I always like is, um, a lot of times when we're developing stories, this, uh, we're stories, like the game, actually, we have, we call them user stories. User stories sound goofy. They're a way for us to track work and it, but the user stories are always phrased, um, as a game developer, as a player, as an artist, as a whatever, I can do this. Um, it's how we like, if I'm trying to get um, someone to change the conversation editor so that it's easier for me to copy lines, I will put in a work request that says user story. As a writer, I can copy lines easily with, you know, with only two button clicks. And that will go into our backlog of work. What actually helps me is hearing, the same, hearing it in the same way from fans. As a player, I want to be able to play a blood mage. As a player... I want to be able to uh, participate in a transgender romance. As a player, I want to be able to, uh, you know, betray the organization I'm working for. You know, that doesn't guarantee that every one of those, you know, will hit, but we definitely hear that and go, okay, that's interesting. You know, and the, and the ones you hear repeatedly, the, you know, Blood Mage comes up a lot because we had it in previous games. And then the ones that come up a lot, as a player, I'd like to do this. Okay, when I play the game, I want to be able to play this type of person. Those are the ones that, while we can't guarantee anything, uh, definitely resonate with us. Um, so has Solus gone by any other names that we don't yet know? That one I will have to pass on. I'm sure he probably has at some point, but I can't mm-hmm. tell you what any of them are. Okay, how long has Solus been alive? Well, okay, that one I have to pass on too. 
he's, he's been alive a while. Is he yeah. the result of when a mommy ancient elf and a daddy <laughs> ancient elf love each other very much? Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, these are questions I look forward to answering or not in future content. Okay. If at some point cool. we do yeah. future content. <laughs> um, oh gosh, I have to f- ask my favorite fan question. This All one right, is really good. hit it. Okay, would you rather fight one high dragon sized nug or 100 nug sized dragons? Okay, that is a good question, and I have two separate answers. Okay. Okay, so in terms of chances of coming out of the battle alive, the obvious answer is the dragon sized nug. <laughs> because it is large, but it remains fundamentally a prey animal, and it runs around um, with, you know, flappy little loose creepy skin instead of armor um, <laughs> and scales, and no one has ever killed a nug and gone, awesome, I can use this to make my high-end endgame armor. So, whereas a dragon is made entirely How out of stuff. How do you know stuff. my high-end endgame armor wasn't nug skin, Patrick? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I apologize for assuming that people do not craft their high-end endgame armor out of nug skin. Nevertheless, <laughs> those people are playing wrong and are bad and should feel bad about themselves. But <laughs> So, realistically, that's the one I'm likely to come out of alive. However, mm-hmm. that battle, I can just imagine I'd hit it from below and like the skin would open up and all kinds of blurpy, horrible stuff would spill all over me and it just sounds disgusting and horrible and not like any kind of fight I would actually be proud of like no one ever comes away from a dragon sized nug and goes I earned much glory this day whereas on the other hand a hundred nug sized dragons even though they're individually small like I could see battle songs being sung about you know about the powerful warrior who held the bridge against a hundred nug sized dragons so I would almost certainly be killed painfully uh, you know, like nibble to death and covered in dragons at the end of it. But I think that would still, that would be, that would be a way that, you know, won you glory in the afterlife. So that's the one I'm going to have to go with. Uh, so is what happened with Cole a normal thing for a spirit of compassion or was it kind of an isolated special case? So I would say it is an isolated special case. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. a one-off event. Uh, because we've established that uh, when the veil is thin, uh, spirits can come through, and it's certainly possible for spirits to get confused. A spirit of compassion, like Cole, uh, is one who is more likely to become confused trying to deal with someone who's in a great deal of pain and empathizing, actually becoming the person whose pain they're empathizing with. Um, so I wouldn't say it's something that's that's likely to happen or something that is uh, common in a way that we're going to go to very often, uh, but it's definitely not a, a one-off, this could only happen once event. Okay, okay, cool. Last question. What is one thing you have always wanted to tell people about Inquisition, but have never been asked? You know, it's funny, because you, you sent me these questions, and I have been thinking about trying <laughs> to figure out anything that I have not already blabbed about because somebody asked it. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, as goofy as it is, I think Mother Giselle is one of my favorite ones because she doesn't come up very often. She, most people just see her as this character you talk to in Haven. Mm-hmm. And I would, I, I wish people talked more to Mother Giselle because I feel like without Mother Giselle, we have a game that is in many ways about faith but ultimately says it always comes down to magic and powerful mages uh, punching each other with lightning bolts. Mm -hmm. And Mother Giselle is the voice of the mostly reasonable religious person. Mm -hmm. And I think she's important in in a story about faith to have that. Because I think that in a lot of cases, you tell a story that's about faith and about religion And it's all too easy for that to come down to, ah, but this is just made up. And, you know, yeah, the stories are false, but believing can make you do good things. And too many people fall back on that as an easy message. Uh, Because it's, it's the comforting thing that lets you say, we're not saying religion is bad. We're just saying it's not true, but you can still be nice. And I really don't like that. I don't like closing that door. Uh, I don't want to ever, 
um, you know, as Dave Gator has left the Dragon Age franchise and, and, and I've moved, moved over, I don't want to ever say there is no maker. I don't want to ever completely confirm it because if you confirm mm-hmm. it, then you have no need for faith. But I don't like the stories where you completely answer and the answer is no. And I think a character like Giselle who can get – who you can have talks with and say, okay, but I don't believe this. This doesn't seem to work. And she has an answer other than, I don't know. I think that's fun. And I think that is something worth listening to. Thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me, Patrick. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Patrick Weeks. Be sure to also check out my interviews with Bioware producer Liz Laytonin, Heroes of Dragon Age mobile community manager Deanna Jones, as well as several others. For more Dragon Age, Mass Effects, and Bioware-related videos, subscribe to my channel by clicking the big red subscribe bar up here on the screen. For instant news coverage of Bioware games, you can follow me on Twitter and other forms of social media, links to which can be found down in the video description. If you like my videos and would like to donate to help support my channel, head on over to my Patreon page. For more information about how your donations can help me improve my channel, here's a link to a video about that provided on screen as well.